Hi again, hope you're well. Um, firstly, an admission. I've been putting something off. And this video is my attempt at uh, renewing my enthusiasm for that project. Uh, I'm talking, of course, about part two of my fall primer. And uh, in my defense, trawling through 28 years of studio recordings, 20 albums, countless EPs, it can feel like a bit of a chore when you're trying to whittle everything down to a compact playlist of just 20 songs. Or didums, I know. Look, back off, okay. I, I, I don't want your pity. Anyway, in the process of combing through all that fall, I was struck by a troubling thought. Is this really necessary? Short answer, in the case of the fall at least, is yes. It's just the nature of some bands back catalogues. Crucially, not all bands back catalogues, uh, especially if the aim is just to give new listeners a jumping off point. Which brings me to today's video. What if there are albums, whole albums out there, that fulfill just that role? I'm calling these Goldilocks albums. Not too hot, not too cold, just right. I pointed one of these uh, sweet spot albums out the last time I did one of these kind of stand up videos. Um, that one was Radiohead's In Rainbows. So these aren't necessarily the best, the greatest, the most lauded albums by these artists, although sometimes they might be. Uh, but they kind of all tend to pitch up in a good place. Uh, they offer a great window into what these people are about. Uh, they give an idea of where they come from and where they're headed. Uh, they're just right. So here we go. Ten Goldilocks albums that do all the legwork for you and provide, I think, an optimal starting point for a first time listener. Starting off in no particular order at one. I've got Captain Beefheart and the Magic Band with from 1972, Clear Spot. Yeah, starting off with the wrong Bifa album to begin with uh, has done for many a listener. Yes, Trout Mask Replica or Lick My Decals Off Baby are works of Twisted Genius, but they can be a bit, a bit much on a first listen. And I think Clear Spot saw Van Vliet uh, dial things back a little bit. The clattering freeform textures of Trout Mask are still in there, but they're kind of bolted onto a more straight ahead, a kind of a blues rock chassis. There's even the very occasional detour into a more soulful kind of Stax Booker T style songwriting in the form of the lovely Too Much Time. But for the most part, this is pure beef art, just with training wheels and knee pads. Some great tracks here, Long Neck Bottles, Circumstances, uh, Sun Zoom Spark and the amazing Big Eyed Beans from Venus. Uh, for me, the compromises made here uh, just work for Clear Spot. Uh, and for me, it's the archetypal Goldilocks record. A second up at two, and if you do want to try and categorize this, this would be my kind of 50-50 record. Yeah, I, I've got Neil Young and Crazy Horse with 1979's Rust Never Sleeps. Why 50-50? Well, it does that kind of Dylan bringing it all back home trick of splitting between an electric and an acoustic side. And uh, in this case, it delivers handsomely on each of them. This album catches Shaky at the happier end of the 70s, for him at least, uh, heading into a much more mixed 80s that saw him mired in kind of label aggro for most of that decade. Essentially recorded live with the audience edited out, you get two versions of Hey Hey My My, or My My Hey Hey, uh, the campfire one and the arena one, uh, the absolutely jaw-dropping powder finger, and I think a pair of Neil's best acoustic numbers in Thrasher and, and the wonderful Pocahontas. Starting here, you can head back through the ditch to his kind of folky Harvest, Gold Rush stuff, or you can power on through to his grungier 90s period. Uh, both are clearly signposted on Rust Never Sleeps. Uh, at three, uh, dialing things down a little with one of those kind of curiously piecemeal albums that just hangs together perfectly, almost despite itself. Uh, from 1990, this is United Kingdom by American Music Club. For an album of ostensibly bits and pieces cobbled into an import-only release for the British market, they were critical darlings at this point, United Kingdom is a beautiful summation of where the band were uh, on the cusp of major label recognition, while still kind of drunkenly walking on the edge of every emotional precipice that Mark could find. They'd make bigger statements with Everclear and uh, the incredible Mercury, uh, but this one is content to just occupy a corner of your psyche and, you know, just eat away at you. You get the spine-tingling plea of Dreamers of the Dream, uh, the seesawing melancholy of the title track, 
the soul bearing anguish of that you know skeletal ghostly Kathleen and the bleakly blackly comic croon of the hula maiden yeah pardon the forced rhyme but this is what happens when the bits just fits um it sounds like a compilation made specifically for you you know the intimacy and the melodrama just just tie together perfectly onwards uh, my big discovery of last year was proto Mata via the uh, formal growth in the desert album my favorite thing released by anybody in 2023 as a consequence i went deep into their back catalog which thankfully for my bank balance uh, isn't too extensive at the moment and in there i discovered at four um the agent intellect from 2015. what makes this one my sweet spot choice well it just feels completely representative of you know all the elements um i've been soaking up you know starting with 2012's no passion all technique and culminating in formal growth in the desert their earlier kind of rough, uh, more squared off, brutish even vibe uh, bubbles up through the clanging, uh, monolithic cowards starve. But the subtleties and nuances of Greg Ahe's guitars and arrangements really begin to emerge on this album, I think, in tracks like Pontiac 87 and Why Does It Shake? And that formal growth uh, foregrounded on their latest is evident here too. Uh, Joe Casey's lyrics feel like they take a huge step up on intellect. Um, by turns, you know, unsparing, forensic even. And then on, you know, the wonderful Ellen, suffused with love and warmth and sorrow and hope. Uh, a relatively short discography, I guess, only six albums. Um, might make this a spurious choice, but for me, uh, it's definitely a stylistic, you know, an evolutionary, an emotional sweet spot for the band, which should be enough to draw you in to their world, you know, a little further. Okay, so some bands it feels live two lives, either through you know aesthetic upheaval, personnel changes, or as a result of entirely external conditions. You know, tastes may turn, uh, scenes might implode, the media might move on. And at five, I've got an album by a band that in 1995 found themselves in exactly that position. Uh, this is My Brother the Cow by Mud Honey. I think it's probably pretty fair to say that grunge died in 94 with Kurt Cobain, or at least as far as the wider media were concerned. But like the dude, uh, Mud Honey abides. Uh, they're still very much with us as last year's Plastic Eternity album uh, should amply demonstrate. And that's the thing, really. If you only ever think grunge when you think Mud Honey, then sure, uh, Super Fuzz Big Muffle, Every Good Boy Deserves Fudge will be what you know you reach for. But my brother, the cow pulls double duty for me. Uh, firstly, laying bare that they were always a garagey, stooges, blue cheer loving band who stuck to their guns, you know, throughout the whole roller coaster ride. And secondly, I also think it has a pretty good claim to being their best album. Your mileage may vary, I get that, but if you're looking at Mud Honey in the round, not just as some grunge time capsule, then this is a great starting place. Roller King opener, Judgment, Rage, Retribution and Time busts out some corrosive, queasy electric slide. On Generation Spokesmodel and Into Your Shtick, uh, Mark Arm gives both barrels to the industry quizlings who rode the grunge bandwagon. Um, yeah, the whole album just revels in a splattery kind of bluesy atmosphere. I think it's held up really well. And The Closer, 1995, uh, very capably recasts The Stooges' 1970, including sax, uh, for a new generation. You could make a quip about this being mid-honey. Um, but timeline aside, that would be entirely wide of the mark. It's a great record. Moving on, um, bands and artists with periods. Their greatest albums inevitably fall within one or other of these. You know, R.E.M. would be an off the top of my head kind of example. You know, the early IRS albums like Murmur or later Warner's ones like uh, Automatic for the People. But that's all fine and good, but it's rare to find a band with an album that really satisfyingly bridges different periods. I think I've got one here, though, with At Six, Huskadoo, and 1985's Flip Your Wig. I'm not going to ever do this one, but if you find, you know, Zen Arcade too rough, too much, or the crispy production of Warehouse bothers you, then I think Flip Your Wig is a great middle ground. Still an SST, but for the first time, no spot on recording duties. Uh, it's a great kind of balanced huge sounding Huskers record with no obvious downsides. 
Bob and Grant are still playing relatively nicely with one another. Um, great contributions from each. Bob's makes no sense at all. Grant's wonderful green eyes. And it also contains a few underrated deep cuts. Um, Find Me and Private Plane are both here on Flip Your Wig. Both of them Bob's and yeah, I'm very fond of them both. Basically a classic Goldilocks record, catching the band at a great time with some amazing songs, but I don't hear this pegged as anyone's favourite Puskas album very often. Seventh then, and uh, I'm about to attempt the impossible here and try and choose a perfect Bowie album for the new listener. Yeah, maybe this is, uh, you know, the one case where a compilation or a curated list would be a better choice. But nonetheless, at seven, uh, yeah, I'll take Station to Station. What would you call this? A Crossroads album, maybe? Falling at the end of that brief Plastic Soul period following Glam and just pre the Eno trilogy. Any choice here? You can't win, really. But this is a great record, arguably his best, but if not, you know, it's right up there. If it's a Goldilocks record, then, then maybe only in the kind of transitional sense, signposting the change that was to come, while still being an entirely monolithic thing in its own right. Yeah, the title track, um, Golden Years, TVC15. Yeah, you know, uh, they should be enough to convince anyone. Consider it the opening parenthesis before the Berlin trilogy. So yeah, a good station to jump on board at, I reckon. And again, uh, not uh, ducking the difficult discogs here. <laughs> Let's have a stab at Nick Cave and the Bird Seeds. Yeah, that's approaching 20 studio albums at this point, so uh, not an easy one. What have you got to cover? The fractured impressionistic blues flavour of that early, you know, just post-birthday party period. Uh, the balladeer phase. Um, the Warren Ellis period. Yeah, it's a lot of ground to cover. But this is one of those cases where... Um, like the final two on this list, I think the artist's best album sits right in the middle of that, you know, imaginary Venn diagram. The songs and the styles and the signifiers all converge, making this one a no-brainer introduction. A date from 1994, I've got Let Love In. Yeah, on Lover Man, Jangling Jack, Thirsty Dog, Red Right Hand, you get a taste of that manic, Bible-smacking, Berlin, Libertine-era cave. You also get the kind of nick at the piano stuff, the big soulful gospel tinged feel of that period from The Boatman's Call right up to Abattoir Blues. Uh, examples there, yeah, the title track, um, Lay Me Low, oh, and Nobody's Baby Now. A lot of people's favourite Bad Seeds album because of all this, I think. Uh, yeah, it pushes a lot of buttons in a fairly tight space. And that compactness is what makes it an ideal introduction. Obviously, Nick's more recent stuff inevitably coloured and informed by the tragic death of his son Arthur in 2015, uh, needs to be taken as an entirely different creative phase of his life, I think. So approach those albums, Skeleton Tree Ghosting, uh, in isolation would be my advice. At nine, uh, another utterly singular artist that can be a wee bit daunting. Yeah, this is Bjork, and I've chosen 1997's Homogenic. Excuse the sticker on there. It's one of those CD DVDs. I was torn between this one and 2001's Vespertine here, um, but a few standout songs on Homogenic, you know, all helped tip the balance. Um, Hunter, Yoga, the lovely Bachelorette. But the elephant in the room with Bjork is really just quite how out there her 21st century albums have gone from the entirely vocal Medalla in 2004 to 2022's Fungal Foray for Sora. Bjork always asks a lot of the listener, but the rewards are there. Just be prepared to work a little to get them. For that reason, uh, skewing earlier in her back catalogue makes sense when trying to, you know, sniff out the sweet spot. And I think Homogenic works great in that respect. And finally, at 10, finally an easy one. Some bands just have such an innate sound, a style, an approach that, yeah, you know it's them within seconds. Choosing an entry point is simply a case of picking their best album and just letting the magic happen. So last up at 10, this is 1997's I Can Hear the Heart Beating As One by Yola Tango. Yeah, definitely one of those cases where that question I posed back at the beginning of this video, you know, is this playlist, is this mixtape really necessary, is rendered completely irrelevant. Because if you don't love Yola Tango by the end of this record, then they're just not for you. And you are fine to just move along. Tracks, uh, Sugar Cube, Damage, Deeper Into Movies, Stockholm Syndrome, Autumn Sweater, The Lion, How We Told It, 
Yeah, this is one of the greatest indie rock albums of the 1990s, without question. Uh, and I'm happy to leave it at that. And that's a wrap. That's 10. Bit of a slippery definition for this one, maybe. Uh, but hopefully I got there and you get where I'm coming from. Do you have any Goldilocks records you'd care to highlight? You know, maybe not the artist's best, but a great summation of what they were or are about. Drop a comment down below uh, and let me know your choices. But that's it for this video. Yeah, um, as ever, uh, likes, subscriptions are all uh, very, very welcome. They do help the channel along. But basically, thanks for watching. And uh, I will see you again soon. Take care and bye for now.